next talk is from Nicolas Mattia, and it's uh, an overview of language support in Nix. So, uh, let's start. Hi, everyone. So, thanks for coming. First of all, a bit of background. I started using Nix at work about three years ago. And I was suffering from Nix a bit. I was a bit of a Nix hostage. But then two years ago, I went to the Nix con in Munich and kind of opened my eyes. So I'm still suffering now, but I got a bit of a Stockholm syndrome, so I'm enjoying it. <laughs> so the talk today is about language support in Nix. It's going to be not, I'm trying to make it not tied to any language in particular, but I have a background in Haskell and now a bit of Rust, so there might be a few language specific things. And it's going to be in three parts, basically. The first part is going to be the basics, just so that we all agree on the vocabulary and what's happening, what's a compiler, what's a build tool, the difference between the two. And then the approaches. So the approaches that are used in Nix packages and elsewhere nowadays to actually package Nix code or package language codes in Nix. And then the last one is going to be a bit of an overview and a few takeaways from what's right now, where we could go in the future, and the best approaches. So let's start with the basics. Enter the matrix. We're going to kind of articulate everything around a few axes. So on the left hand, we have the fixed output derivation, cogeneration, log file base, and pure nix. These are all general approaches used nowadays. And we kind of try to mix them and match them with three key aspects or three metrics. The first one is the UX. So how easy is it to use? any of these approaches. So does it just work? This is very important most of the time because you wanna, if you wanna build something, you wanna package something, you want it to work. You don't wanna have to debug it or figure out new flags and you want it to just work. And the second one, which I think is important is, is it consistent with the user workflow? That is, if your user is using, for instance, Cargo to build Rust or Cabal to build Haskell code, is this build going to use the same tools or is it going to be some special mechanism that's going to try to recreate the logic? So ideally, it would just work and the result is the same as using the native tools. Then the big problem in Nix in particular is incrementality. If you change a single command somewhere, are you going to have to wait an hour for everything to rebuild? Incrementality is about making builds as short as possible when possible. And this is usually handled by the, the build tools themselves. They do it pretty well. But in Nix, it's always a question because you have this derivation, which is, okay, here's the lock step. If you change any input, then the whole derivation is going to be rebuilt. So we try to make the derivations as small as possible for incrementality. And then the evaluation. Something that's not really talked about much in Nix, but it's basically the raw overhead that Nix brings on top of the build tool. So it's all the Nix evaluation that happens before your code or your build code is actually run. So for instance, if you have Nix packages, Nix needs to go through everything, evaluate the packages, and be like, okay, I'm gonna pull this one, I'm gonna pull this one, pull this one, and then it's gonna tell you, okay, I'm gonna fetch this, and I'm gonna run these commands. So the evaluation is the first step. So the first and simplest approach, oh, vocabulary first, my bad. We're going to talk about compilers, build tools, and that's pretty much it. The compiler is the thing that actually compiles your code. This is something that you can't get away with. The build tool is the thing that kind of puts the pieces together and calls the compiler here, forwards the build outputs there. And sometimes you can actually get rid of it in Nix. We'll talk about it more later, but the compiler is, is something you never want to re-implement in Nix. Whereas the build tool, the build tool, ah, as we'll see, it's possible, even though it might not be nice. So let's go with the approaches. The very first one is the fixed output derivation. If you don't want to spend any time thinking about it, you do that. So you run a command. Your command can do anything you want. It can call network. It can fire missiles. Everything you want. And you just kind of tell Nix, hey Nix, listen, the output is gonna have this hash, trust me on this. And if the output actually has the, when hashed gets 
the exact output hash, the next is going to say, fine, I'm going with you. But so even though it's the simplest to implement for anything, it has a few drawbacks. First, evaluation is super fast because Next doesn't have to do any job. It just checks the checksum, and if everything is good, fine. There's no no special logic there. Incrementality is pretty bad because whenever you change anything, you have to rerun. And I'll go more into into that in a second. But the UX for me is the worst because what happens is that whenever you have a single input changing in your build. So for instance, your user adds dependency for a Node.js program or anything, you're gonna have to change the hash by hand, the checksum. And it gets even worse if you forget to change it because Nix is gonna just look up the hash, it's gonna be like, oh, I already have this in the store. So fine, your build is fine. Even though in practice, it would generate a new build with new build out output. And so the question is, can we improve this so that you don't have this huge lockstep and this huge fixed output derivation? And you can say, well, most of the time the local code changes. When you, you edit, you might add a function, change some things, but the dependencies that you pull in, those rarely change. They change maybe once a week or once a day, but that's not too often. So this is something we're gonna look at in a second, but first a few warnings. So, Nix is not meant as a content addressable store. So when you have those hashes in a Nix store, they're based on the inputs of the build, not the actual output. And so using the, the hash as a, as a key is kind of against the Nix model. What's very dangerous is that you have to trust a lot of things. First, you have to make sure that you didn't screw your build phase, that your build phase is always gonna call the same functions, they're always gonna run the compiler in the exact same way. Then you have to trust the remote content. If you're pulling dependencies from somewhere, you have to make sure that those, the URLs that you use, they're always gonna uh, give you the same bytes. Otherwise, your build's gonna change. And you have to trust compiler reproducibility. So if your compiler decides to generate different outputs depending on the, um, the day of the week, for instance, as GHC did at some point, <laughs> then you might have something that works for you and then you give it to your coworker, you're like, hey, here's this Nix code, it's gonna, it's gonna work just fine. But at the end of the day, their code is gonna be different. Their generated output is gonna be different. It's gonna have a different hash that doesn't match the one that you put. And so your coworker is gonna be angry at you and it's something you don't want. So about those dependencies. Uh, no, not dependencies. The yeah, so, the, so another approach where you don't use the fixed output derivation is that you just run some external tool that pulls these dependencies for you and compiles the hashes for you. This is an approach that's used widely in Nix. It's the foo to Nix. So you have stack to Nix, pypy to Nix, uh, yarn to Nix. And in this case, you have a tool like Bundix for Ruby that you call and it just generates Nix files for you. These Nix files, you then import them in your code and use it. But there's a problem because first you have to check in all this generated code so that everyone uses the same. So in terms of UX, it's not very good. Then that means that you have your next build for the build. You might have an NPM build when you build locally, but on top of that, you have an extra step that you need to run every time, which generates this next code. On the other hand, the incrementality can be good. It depends on how the generated code, wor generated, generated code works. Sorry, I'm stumbling a bit. And the evaluation time depends also a lot because it depends on the generated code. So all these for me are not ideal because you have this, this big Nix code that was generated and we're in a time where most programming languages actually provide log files. So log file actually tells you, hey, this is the URL of this dependency, here's the SHA for this dependency, and maybe in order to improve on this terrible UX, we can actually use these log files. And this is the next approach I'm gonna present, which is a bit of a self-plug, because something I've been doing a lot lately. And 
the focus is really user experience. So ideally what you want is to have a single function that you call on some source or on some project that has a log file and the build just works. You have nothing else to do. So NERSC is one I wrote for Rust and I think Elko did something similar as well at some point. And Napalm, Napalm is for JavaScript, of course. And so as you can see, just load the library or say it's in X packages, you just call the function and everything just works. Now, how does that compare? Oh, how does it work first? On the left, you have an example log file. That one is a cargo log file, which is TOML. And as you can see, you have the URL, where a cargo is actually gonna grab the dependency from, or the raw code. And it also gives you the checksum. So technically, Nix would be just happy with that. And indeed, so when NERSC works in a cargo project, it's gonna generate in memory, so it's not gonna generate code, but it's gonna generate something very similar to this. So you have a make derivation, you tell it, hey, the URL is this, the SHA is this, and next is gonna be, okay, I'm gonna pull it, don't lose the dependency, check some, everything is good, and there you go. There's no code that's being generated. So, the problem here is the evaluation because you have Nix, you're asking Nix to parse JSON, if it's a JSON log file, TOML, if it's a TOML log file, and this can actually impact the evaluator quite a bit. You might have, well, long running evaluations before which Nix builds any code. Incrementality is okay, because most of the time you can get away with having per dependency incrementality. So if one dependency changes, then Nix just repulls this one, if you do things well enough, it can even build the dependency as opposed to just grabbing a source code, and then you don't have to rebuild any dependency that wasn't affected. And in terms of UX, it's basically the best in class because when you have a new user coming, you tell them, hey, just do an X build and it's gonna work. If you change code, fine, it's still gonna work. If you add dependencies, edit the log file, fine, it's still gonna be the same dependencies that you used when running Cargo, for instance. So, this is very good, but incrementality is still kind of lacking. It's just okay. So if we go now one step further, this is what I call the pure Nix approach. And this is something I experimented with in Haskell in particular. And the idea is that you don't have per dependency incrementality, but you have per file. If you modify one file, just this file is gonna be rebuilt. If this file is dependent on by other files, okay, then these files are gonna be dependent, gonna be rebuilt as well. But generally, you don't have this big, oh wait, I have to wait three minutes because I changed one comment because Cabal has to rebuild the whole dependency. And it's kind of magic, but actually in practice it works pretty well. So on the left, you have some kind of description of a build where you say, okay, this is my source, it's in this folder, I have a main module, and I have some dependencies. But what Nix is actually gonna generate, or what Nix is gonna run, is something similar to this. Where, by the way, the clicker doesn't work, so I have to use my finger to point, I hope that's okay for you. The important part is that this make derivation, okay, in the name, you use the module name. That depends only on the module. Then you have the build phase. Well, you have the module source, which is the path to, for instance, a Haskell file, that depends on the module, then the module name again, fine, and then the build depths. So it depends only on the module itself and the module dependencies, so nothing else. And then you kind of bake together the top module, so you create a, a graph of all the module, a dependency graph, and you just link everything together. If one module changes, only a specific path in that graph is gonna be changed and it's gonna to have to be rebuilt. But the rest, all the other modules, all the other object files are still gonna be there and you can reuse them. This is fairly nice because you have basically the same level of incrementality as Cabal or Cargo outside of Nix. Now, there's an evaluation problem. 
I wrote Snack about a year ago, and a few months later, a company approached me and said, hey, I really love this Snack thing. Like, this is really the right way to do stuff. And it works, actually, it compiles. We just have a single problem. The evaluation took seven days. <laughs> so I never dove too much into how the Nix evaluator works. I'm not very good in performance work in general, so I believe this is fixable, but by someone else than me. <laughs> but in general, this is the big problem because you're delegating all the work to Nix. Nix is an evaluated language compared to, for instance, Cargo, which is just built in Rust, so it's all machine code, just checking the, the end times, checking the checksums of some files. So now everything happens in Nix. On the other hand, incrementality is best in class. If you think about it for a Haskell, oh, by the way, how many Haskellers do we have here? Okay, this is beautiful. <laughs> incrementality is even better than that of Cabal, because in Cabal, if you have a Cabal library where you change a single file and you depend on that library, well, Cabal is gonna decide, I have to rebuild this library. Whereas in Snack, it's just gonna look at the module dependency, and most of the library won't be rebuilt, especially if it's a top-level file. It's just going to recompile that file, and then only your files that depend transitively on that file. So this is kind of beautiful. How's the UX? It's complicated. Because the way Snack works is it's basically a big Nix library and a tiny executable around it. And the executable itself calls Nix build. So UX is pretty good if you get the executable right, but there's some cost because then your engineers need to learn how to work with Snack. You can't tell them, oh, use Cabal, because Cabal is just not gonna work there. So you have to teach them a new tool and you basically have to get it right, which I did in Snack. So, we have all these approaches that go from something very coarse grain when you had the fixed output derivation that just rebuilds everything, and then maybe you can just abstract away the dependencies, have these in a fixed output derivation, and then rebuild your local, local projects much faster. Then we had the generated code, then we have the log file based, and then we have the pure Nix approach. So they all have different trade-offs. Some are good, some, some have fast evaluation, some are incremental, and we basically have this. So in terms of, for the fixed output, the UX is terrible, once again, because you need to change the hash whenever anything changes. Incrementality, ouch, bad as well. Evaluation, on the other hand, is fast. Fixed output with depths, it's pretty much the same, except that you have better incrementality, because the hash changes only when any of your dependencies change, but not when your top-level project, the one you work on locally, changes. And evaluation is still fast, so that's good. Code generation. UX, once again, is pretty bad because you have to rerun an external tool whenever you have a change in your code. Incrementality, <sighs> depends. Depends how the generated code works. Depends on many factors, which might depend on the tool. So if it's stacked to Nix, it might be good. If it's Bundix, it might be bad. It might be the other way around. Depends very much. Evaluation is pretty much the same. For the log file, UX is great. You have the same commands that run as in Cargo, but in Nix, incrementality is okay, depending on how you, you code it up. Evaluation is slow. And the pure Nix, once again, UX complicated because you need to build new tools and incrementality is amazing, but evaluation is bad. So the main takeaway here is, uh, well, Nix doesn't work, right? We, we, can't all, we can't have all of them. We can't have the cake and eat it. So what do we do? There's actually a more interesting question, which is, well, maybe we don't need to have a single approach for everything. And maybe we should split the approaches by users. So for instance, we have a newcomer, someone who's just discovered Nix, actually like it, is actually interested in using Nix, and well, for him, 
it should just work, right? Because you told him, hey, it's gonna just work. But then that person might not care very much about evaluation time or incrementality. They're gonna try next build. It's gonna build their huge Java project that they never managed to get compiled before, and they're happy. Uh, then you have the power user, which I think is most of the people in this room, you're like, you really like Nix, and you don't mind adapting your tools to Nix. You don't mind writing wrappers around Nix. You, you're happy with anything, but you use it very, very often. So that means that evaluation and incrementality must be very good, because Nix then becomes your primary tool. And then you have a different user, which is not a real user, but it's a machine user, I'll call it, which is the packages that are in Nix packages. These are usually not built by hand on your machine. They tend to be cached. The problem is, for evaluation, for instance, if you pull or if you evaluate Nix packages, you want this to be fast. You want it to be extremely fast because you're gonna be evaluating tons and tons of packages. You might have 400 dependencies for your single local project. So this step, you want it to be extremely fast. The rest, bah, you don't really care about it. You might have bots that generate code that's then checked in Nix packages, but that's fine. You, as a person, don't have to care about it. And then you have the Nix hostage. The Nix hostage is the guy at your company who you told, Nix is gonna be amazing. Let's use Nix. <laughs> and this person needs perfect UX because they don't wanna care about Nix. They want fast evaluation because you told them, yes, of course, you can use it as your primary build tool. It needs to be incremental. Otherwise, they're gonna complain about CI, which they usually do. <laughs> so, can we kind of have all this? Well, there are kind of tensions. Incrementality, for instance, most of the time you require build tool knowledge. So if you wanna have per dependency incrementality, you need to know, for instance, how NPM works. How does it actually insert dependencies in its cache? If you go with the extreme of the pure Nix snack-like approach, then you need to know even how the compiler works and how, what flags it accepts, how it's expecting its dependencies or the, the pre-built object files. And then the more incremental you get, the more you're gonna get the evaluator to work. So this is something you gotta really care about. And then you have these Nix hostages that need the best of all possible worlds. So maybe we should have a multi-tier approach in Nix packages and elsewhere, where you could have Nix packages that has some very fast fixed output derivation like builds, and then you might have a log file, like a snapshot of all dependencies that you can choose from, and it's gonna be whatever tool you use, is gonna read that file, check the checksums, and then build all your dependencies using that, but only the dependencies. And then for your local build, you might have something that's very pure Nix-like. So this is pretty much what Snack does right now. And I think it's something that we rediscovered recently with Bazel, where they have dependencies that come built with Cabal. They use the stack, stackage snapshot, but then for day-to-day -day users, you only rebuild your packages fast with built-in Bazel primitives. And I think this is something that's quite, quite interesting. Even more interesting would be if we could have that without the user knowing about it. So maybe you could have two or three different mechanisms that kind of switch. If Nix realizes that this is a dependency you don't use often, then it's gonna push it back. It's gonna use the more fixed output derivation like builds and if it's something you change regularly, then it's gonna use the pure Nix implementation. So, this was pretty much it, but there's one interesting question, which is, can recursive Nix help with this? So I'm gonna let you read the code for a second. That have appeared on the GitHub issue for recursive Nix. What it says is basically, so it's a statement, but any solution that it, the incremental build problem that involves the build system is going to be brittle, which is very true. 
that's what happened to Snack. And it's going to essentially re-implement the logic of any build system in Nix. And once again, Nix is evaluated, it's slow, and yeah. So this is not something you want to do for every language, or if you want to do it, you gotta spend a lot of time and resources on it to make it work right. And now that we're talking more and more about recursive Nix and that thing the implementation is coming, you could have Nix as the new Ccache. So Ccache is a speed up for the for GCC or any GCC like compiler, where if it realizes that it's the arguments have already been used in a present call, then it's gonna say, hey, wait a second, I already have the build output somewhere over there. Which technically is what Nix does, right? Because Nix will hash all its inputs, and if all this happened already, it's gonna say, yeah, reuse this derivation that was built X days ago. So maybe recursive Nix would be a good solution for this, where say you have a build tool like Cargo, or Make, or anything like that, and you kind of lie to it. You say, hey, Make, instead of calling GCC here, just call Nix, and you have this in your Nix build. And basically, when I started the talk, I said, well, the build tool is something we can emulate in Nix, whereas the compiler is something, it's a given. It's not something we can get rid of. Maybe with recursive Nix, we kind of can. We leave the build tools to actually drive the builds, but we plug in Nix as the compiler. If Nix doesn't have the derivation pre-built, then fine, you recall the compiler, but in general, most of the time, your object files are gonna be just fetched from the cache. And that's pretty much it. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Any questions? Hey, uh, great talk. So what do you think about the, um, so the, there is a code gen option, right? Um, but I think if, if you start using import from derivation there, you, you kind of gain the UX back in, in, um, in that option. Have you considered that? So you're saying that if you use import for derivation for directly importing Nix code, then you don't have to check in the generated code. Yeah, yeah, and you don't have to do, so Haskell, Haskell.nix is, is essentially uh, that approach. I think the talk is tomorrow, so. Um, but I think you, you get good UX and you get semi-OK evaluation <laughs> times, again, depending on what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so I think it's the sweet spot, but of course all the incrementality is, is not there, so. So I think this one is actually, or Haskell.nix in general is closer to the log file approach. Because if you don't use a log file, then okay, you might generate codes, but you still need to figure out the hashes, right? The checksums. So. I think it's different from the, the code gen that I talked about here. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it makes sense. Because uh, so you can't use that without any table of hashes that you had before, right? Or log right. files. Yeah, I, th I think it's somewhere in the middle. So some things you have the hashes from, like there's uh, snapshots of hackage and stackage and all of that. Uh, but if it's coming from Git, for example, then you don't have it, right? So it's no, somewhere in the middle. Yeah. But yeah. I didn't talk about the Haskell infrastructure at all, actually, because it's quite complex and I never really wrapped my head around it. But there's lots of smart stuff there, which wasn't covered at all in this talk. All right, okay, okay. I, I was just wondering if you uh, thought about the IFD. So, yeah, okay, cool. I think it was a question in the back, or maybe it was a, an answer? It's more, yeah, a, a follow up comment. Um, Haskell and Nix does both. Um, I think one problem with the peer lock file approach is that um, the build tools themselves don't just use the lock file. They also cons consult the cargo.toml or cabal file or other thing. Um, so if the point is doing the things the way the tool would go from the plan, I think you do need to ingest both or lobby them to work differently upstream, pick your poison. Um, but yeah, I, I think the, the IFD should help a lot in if you do enough little ones, it should even be pretty good for the evaluation incrementality. So, fingers crossed. Yeah. Thank you. 
one point you really have to keep in mind when you do dynamic uh, uh, recursive NICs with dynamic dependencies that you, like, in wi while evaluating the, the tree or the, the graph of what you have to build, you don't know everything in front. So you have to generate parts of the graph while you are building because you have to build something. And IFD already does that, but it has the restriction that it can't access network while doing it, right? So you have to check in the, the log file and then maybe generate Nix code on the fly in the build and then uh, evaluate that. But you really have to be careful like what uh, what you require from the generated graph you want to generate on the fly. I think the best of all worlds right now is to do this, integrate the package managers and use the log files. That's like the, the best approach. But really, really need to go upstream and nudge the package manager creators to produce log files that we can actually use because, for example, for Yarn, sometimes there's only a git hash for, of a git ref and no output of the git repository, so you, you have still need uh, network to, to generate the, the next file again. So that's Yeah, completely agree. So it seems to be a trend in a build files or build tools to not output a git hash for or hash for git dependencies. And I completely agree. We need to find a way to tell build tools, hey, please, guys, some people might actually need this. And uh, maybe as Nix grows and becomes, becomes more used widely, then we're going to have more ways to actually convince them to add checksums pretty much everywhere. And uh, yeah, that would be ideal. I want to just say I think that's already happening. I think that, I mean, we do see build tools doing more. Um, I mean, Cabal now is calling itself Nix style. Um, and I think that the, the ev you know, the, the value is clear. And as we, as Nix gets bigger, it, it you know, it, the, we don't have to do everything ourselves. Um, people will build tools that integrate better with Nix. And I think that's a, a good avenue to approach. Yeah. In the particular case of Cabal, I think they went the wrong direction. <laughs> Instead of making it easier for Nix to use, they kind of grab the ideas from Nix and uh, messed up their UX at the same time. That's unrelated. So you mentioned that evaluator performance is often very slow. Did you do any investigation into whether there are easy speed ups for this? No, but uh, some people have, and there are a few people here at NixCon. So I think they're mostly low hanging fruits because I think it was the case in uh, Nix packages and a few other projects. So this is not too much of a worry for me. If we're getting to more pure Nix builds, where Nix actually replaces the build tool, I'm pretty sure there are solutions to the evaluation problem. So a follow-up question to this. In most languages, compiling an individual translation unit is generally very fast. So tools like Ccache have this constraint where it is often more expensive to determine if the cache has something that it can replace than it is to just compile it with GCC for most translation units. Um, do you, so do you think it's feasible to get the Nix evaluator to be so fast that it is you know, close to as fast as Ccache at determining whether it has a translation unit replacement? I have no idea. <laughs> but it's even worse than that because every single Nix derivation, especially if you build in sandbox, there's a lot of infrastructure happening. First, setting up the sandbox and then only kicking in the build. So yeah, these are all things we should keep in mind if we're going to get something that's close in performance and see cash. Um, great talk. Uh, as a fellow Thank you. Uh, uh, Nick's hostage, I, uh <laughs> <laughs> I also th thought it was a bit of a scary talk, but I have a question about the, um, the, the pure Nick solution. Because if I understand correctly, does this mean that for every object file in your system, you get an entry into Nick's build? And it is, sorry, into Nick's store? Yes. Ah, lovely. <laughs> this sounds scary at first, but in practice, it's not much of a problem. Most of these object files are are small, and actually, there are some questions there. Like, can we can we improve the the garbage collector in Nix to make sure that okay, maybe all these small files, maybe we can tag them as discarded? Because if you change your a complete module, then you could say, well, these are definitely not going to be used. And a tool like a Pure Nix implementation could say, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to need these anymore. So please get rid of them as fast as possible. That would be very interesting, yeah.
All right. Thank you, everyone.